Buenos días, ¿cómo están? ¿Energía? ¿Les gustaron eh, el desayuno venezolano? ¿Han comido arepas, cachitos, empanadas, el jugo, café? ¿Todo bien, sí? Perfecto. Bueno, gracias por estar aquí. Eh, thank you everyone for being here. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Monroy, and I'm the new uh, director of coalitions for the Libra Initiative uh, for Virginia. Uh, I'm very excited to be here, uh, and I'm very excited that you have all made some time to come here today uh, to be part of this conversation uh, with the Virginia community. Um, uh, before anything, I just want to say that, uh, you know, uh, the topic today, immigration, is very important to me. Uh, you know, I'm the son of immigrants. My father is from Bolivia. My mother is from Colombia. So I've seen the, the uh, being raised as the son of an immigrant, all the struggles. Uh, and I know this conversation today is very important to a lot of the people that we're speaking with and communities across Virginia. So thank you everyone for, for being here very much. So before I introduce our panelists, I just wanna say, uh, talk a little bit about uh, Libre, the Libre Initiative and who we are. So uh, the Libre Initiative was founded in 2011. Uh, it is a nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit, grassroots organization that advances the principles and values of a free and open society uh, to empower the US Hispanic community so it can thrive and contribute to a more prosperous America. And so today we're here to talk again about immigration, and I'm very, very excited about our panelists. We're joined by some fantastic leaders uh, from Virginia, from uh, the community, and from, uh, 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 from the Libre Initiative as well. So I'll introduce uh, my colleague here, uh, Kevin Hernandez, who is the Director of Policy of the Libre Initiative. Danny Vargas is the, uh, a local Virginia business leader and the, the chair of the Friends of the American Latino Museum. And then my friend, uh, Antonio Tejerino, who is the president and CEO of the Hispanic Heritage Foundation. Uh, give them a round of applause for, for being here, folks. <laughs> and before I pass it off to Kevin, uh, I want to remind you all there's uh, no cards on your chairs, if you saw when you were sitting down. Uh, there should be pens at the end of each row. Uh, I ask you, please, uh, to uh, fill out your question, if you have a question uh, related to uh, our topic today. Uh, I will be in the back row uh, with my colleague, uh, Lorenzo Martinez. Lorenzo, raise your hand. Raise your hand, Lorenzo. Lorenzo and myself will be collecting your note cards uh, for our Q&A uh, session towards the end of the panel. So uh, uh, with that, I'm going to pass it off to uh, Kevin. Can, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out here. Uh, my name is Kevin Hernandez, as introduced by, by Michael. Uh, I, I do want to preface this conversation by saying that it is a, a very timely conversation, uh, oftentimes emotionally driven conversation, um, and there are different perspectives to this, and we're going to make sure to respect everyone's perspectives here. Obviously, everyone's welcome to, to share those thoughts, but I, I say that because the, this panel that we have here is, is sort of a broad swath of perspectives, I'd say, uh, when it comes to how to deal with, with certain things, be it immigration, but I think the one thing that we do all have in common is that we want to make sure that we have a better immigration system here in our country, uh, one that is more modernized, that, that allows people to come here in search of opportunity um, and, and be able to de uh, develop their talents uh, in a mutually beneficial way for us as a nation and for, them as, and for them as immigrants. So with that said, I think I'm going to start off with a, a very timely, timely uh, situation that's going on right now and what's going on at the border um, with families being detained at the border, sort of what does that mean, what is going on, is this new, has this happened before? Uh, and I'll just kick it over to Danny first to provide a bit of context. Thanks. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Mucho mejor. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. Tomar tiempo de su fin de semana para una conversación importante. Thank you all for being here, taking time out of your weekend for uh, an important conversation. Um, I'll make a couple of brief remarks and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask my friend uh, Tony to, to speak to it because he has a lot more experience in this matter. I will guarantee you this much in our conversation today. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, left or right, in this conversation, at least from my perspective, I will say things and we will say things that you will agree with, things that you will not agree with, but it's important to be able to have the dialogue so we can talk about how we move forward. Um, we've all seen the images of what's happening uh, on the border, 
uh, between children and parents and law enforcement officers, it's tragic. It touches at our heartstrings. If you are a parent, if you're a human being, if you've ever been a child, uh, it really is moving and, and, and tragic to see that. Uh, having said that, uh, there's also a lot of people that think that some type of action needed to be taken. The one thing that I will tell you is, having been in the White House in the last couple of days, what I know is that they were not prepared to do what they did. They were not prepared to take the action that they took, and they were not prepared to deal with the consequences. I think there were a lot of unintended consequences. Any time that you take a, a decision to take an action or change a policy, a lot of time really ought to be given to thinking about how to go about it in the best way so that it meets the needs and the goals that you're trying to achieve with the least amount of damage to human beings as possible. Um, what I want to see is not only uh, the administration, the executive branch doing things differently, but I, we really need the uh, legislature. We need Congress to take a more proactive role to step in and provide sustainable direction uh, with the force of law behind it. So we're not just relying on single individual decisions on the, from the executive branch. We need the force of law behind a system that can actually take us forward into the rest of the 21st century because the system we have right now is broken. It's not meeting the needs of our economy. It's not meeting the needs of our security. And it's definitely not demonstrating our, our character as a nation. So, uh, but I'll ask Tony to, to comment. I agree completely with everything Danny said, so I don't want to be redundant. Um, I have to tell you that last, last Sunday was Father's Day. And one of the things I reflected on um, and I was very moved by was what I would do for my children. I would do absolutely anything for my children to get them out of harm's way, um, which includes some of the decisions that some of these folks have to make in order to make that journey um, across our borders. Um, I was down there, and I am going back down there um, this week um, to work with Sister Norma, uh, who's a real hero with Catholic Charities on the border in trying to support just the humanitarian effort, taking politics out of it, just the humanitarian part of it. We're from a country that has been pretty stable. Um, I'm talking about Jabin, who's back there, Nicaragüense, and my new friend over here, um, that's been pretty stable. So we haven't had the same issues in the Northern Triangle that other countries have, like El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. However, that's all changed in the last few weeks. There's 180 people that have been killed. Uh, there are hundreds that are missing. I just showed them a video of a whole family that was burned up inside of a house. You had a dictator that is now being challenged. And what's going to happen if, when that, let's say, that gets overthrown? And it's even harder to predict what's going to happen. Are some of these gangs going to move in there that are, for, that are in Honduras that have been kept out because of the government? But now if that government is gone. So are we going to have an influx of our primos coming from Nicaragua? Does that change our perspectives? And that's something we all have to look at is, what would you do as a parent? I see in these children the faces of my children. I don't see a difference. I don't think God sees a difference. I don't want to speak for God, but I would like to say that how I've been brought up, that, that God sees the same thing. Um, I also have to say that I met with four members of the Senate on Thursday, uh, so two days ago. I spent the whole day meeting with them, um, two Republican two that are dealing with this issue, and two of them from Maryland, actually, that were Democrat. None of them could answer the question, what is going to happen to those current children that have been detained? Um, what is the timeline going forward? What's going to happen with the case um, the, you know, the, the, the case that doesn't allow for more than 20 days of children being held. Um, what's the best case scenario? How is this different than any accompanied minors? So um, I think that goes to Danny's point that I don't know how well, out, well thought out this was and it probably would have been better to just make a phone call and say, you know what, let's just change this policy um, instead of actually putting an executive order that now causes another layer of, of confusion and challenges 
I also do want to say that the Obama administration um, was not good on this issue. Um, maybe they weren't separating children from parents, but they also weren't necessarily um, had a process in place in dealing with that surge in 2014. And uh, Antonio, if you could just walk us through very quickly, because I know that you, uh, you know, had a lot of communication with the previous administration when that was going on. So what exactly was the case then in 2014 uh, with the spike of unaccompanied uh, children? Well, this, this, the spike happens, and if you notice that the, the, the spike from Mexico had gone down, and all of a sudden it became a spike from, um, uh, f from Central America and specifically in the Northern Triangle. Interestingly, not from Nicaragua or Costa Rica uh, because they didn't have the same gang problems and violence problems. Um, at that time, and I think currently, um, I don't know what's going on with Venezuela in terms of those rankings, but the most dangerous places on earth was San Pedro de Sula in, in Honduras and San Salvador. Um, currently, I, I, or not currently, but I know a year ago it was San Salvador with a city in Honduras number two, and I think certainly um, Caracas was, was up there now, and Juarez and a couple other places. Um, so what happened was there was this surge in people trying to leave those countries because there was nowhere to turn. Um, you couldn't go, the, the gangs were involved, um, their extortion, and I have actual friends that when they were there had to pay to be able to walk through a street to get to work. Um, or, to, or their kids to go to school or to go to church. Um, you then escaping that and you try to go to the, the government to help and a lot of times the governments are somehow mixed into it. So you have nowhere to go and people's houses were being burned down and as a message and so they left. Um, that surge happened in 2014, I think was the height of it. Um, I went down to work with Sister Norma and, and work with these families. I can tell you that I went down the day that the National Guard was called out um, by then Governor Perry in, 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 um, in Texas. At the same time, militia were coming in, armed militia, uh, to send a message to these kids. These were real kids. These weren't hardened 20-something-year-olds with face tattoos. These were babies. Um, I have a picture in my kitchen and in my office of a woman that I'm, I'm, I'm playing with the baby while she's talking to me, and everybody thinks, oh, is that your wife and baby? And no, this was a woman who was raped twice while she was holding her baby um, because she didn't want to let the baby go. Um, these are tragic cases, and I, and God bless Sister Norma and other real heroes that have nothing but compassion streaming out of them for these people. Yeah, and, and to kind of provide a bit more context about the entire situation. So the Obama administration, what they were doing is they, they were housing families together in detention facilities, correct? Those that were coming along uh, together seeking asylum, which is where the Flora settlement kicked in, uh, which is a 1990, 1997 court case that, um, that, that stated that children may only be detained for a maximum of 20 days. Uh, which kind Protection of, of these kids. Exactly, and so uh, where that brings us today uh, and the current situation that we're in is that even if families are being held together uh, by law currently because of this 1997 court case, children may only be detained by law for a maximum of 20 days. After that, they have to be released either to a family member uh, or they will be put into uh, foster care. So just to kind of provide that context. And because that's of, the complication of the executive order because right. what's going to happen now? Do you now, after 20 days, have to separate the families again if that Flores case doesn't allow for it? Right, which the department, of, so part of the executive order that the uh, president signed this week was that uh, he instructed the Department of Justice to challenge that settlement, uh, the 1997 settlement, to see if they would modify the 20-day maximum arrangement. Um, not knowing what will happen from that, but we'll see. So there's, there's still a lot in the air as far as the legalities of whether children can be detained for, for 20 days or more uh, because of this 1997 court case. Um, and then also, you know, what do you do after those 20 days uh, that the children are, are, are detained with their parents? Um, so there's still a lot in the air, and this is as of this week, so just to kind of provide some, some timely context around that. Um, now, uh, we wanted to frame this entire conversation to talk about immigration as a whole, um, but uh, I'd been remiss if I didn't touch on what was going on uh, at the border um, the past couple weeks more so, I think, uh, since it sort of spiked. 
the amount of families coming to the border seeking asylum and the amount of unaccompanied children, similar to in 2014. Um, but another issue that I think Washington is trying to deal with right now is uh, how to find a solution for the DACA population. So um, for, for those of you in here that may not know, DACA was a, uh, a, a temporary deferment of, of deportation for those that qualified under certain requirements back in 2012 that was created uh, unilaterally by then President Obama. Uh, much has been challenged in the courts when they were trying to extend uh, the population that would be covered under that back in uh, 2014 and, and uh, sorry, when they tried to create it back in 2014 to extend that population and also cover the parents. But ultimately, uh, the courts ruled against that and so uh, there is no protection for parents uh, as of now for DACA recipients. But to kind of bring it back to DACA and what's going on, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that say that we need to come up with a solution. I mean, you look at a poll and most of them will say pretty much the same exact thing, that we need to come up with a solution. But for some reason, Washington hasn't been able to wrap their brain around how to do that. And I say this because I think the three of us may not always agree on the right course of action or, or how to get to a certain uh, end um, on, on various policy issues, right? We, we kind of span the spectrum here. Um, but what is going on right now, uh, an issue that's so understood that needs to be addressed, but yet Congress and Washington just hasn't been able to do anything? Un unfortunately, there's not a whole lot going on. Uh, there's a lot of movement running on a treadmill, but not yeah. actually getting to a destination. I'm gonna step back before talking about DACA. DACA just uh, applies to a particular population, right? Uh, initially it was 800,000, now expanded to about 1.2 million young people that were brought here as, as children, basically. But there is a larger population that uh, falls into the category of undocumented immigrants. The reason, I'm gonna step back and talk about why we are where we are. Uh, it's been 32 years since we last had a substantial material change to our immigration system in the United States. The system itself is broken. I think everybody agrees with that. The system itself that we have right now does not meet the needs of our economy or our security. Um, I'm a proponent of having an immigration system that's uh, more fashioned around the needs of the private sector uh, workforce that, that when we, we are at a point now where we're creating many, many jobs, that's a good thing. We're close to near on, uh, zero unemployment uh, functionally. If we hope to be able to fill those jobs, we need to be able to bring either have a lot more babies uh, or bring people in from, from other parts of the world that can help fill that demand, right? Supply and demand. The system that we have in place right now that we've had for since 1986 does not do that. So when people say, well, why don't these people just, you know, become citizens? It's not that easy. There's not any good mechanism to have people come to this country to fill jobs in a, in a quick way, and there's no uh, simple path for people who are undocumented today to become normalized with the legal process. So the, the conversations around comprehensive immigration reform that we've been working on since 2006 is around creating a system that better meets the, the needs of our economy, creating a system that meets our, the needs of our security and takes care of how to deal with that population of 11 million people. Within that population, there was a segment that we thought, there was broad agreement that since they came as children, let's provide a mechanism by which they can at least be right with the law, right? But even doing that has proved virtually impossible because both sides uh, have chosen to use it as a political football, to blame each other, right, to do this. Uh, and that's gotten us to a point where we're not able to get anything, any legislation passed in Congress, which is why in the case of President uh, Obama with the DACA uh, executive order, um, he did that as a way to be able to sort of band-aid uh, um, uh, um, a system for this, this population. I criticized it at the time because I thought it was just a sugar rush. It didn't have the force of law behind it. It was not sustainable because the next president could come in and just do away with it. And that's exactly what happened, right? So all of us in this room, all of us around the country, all of us that come from the private sector, all of us that care about uh, 
immigration and, and the future of our nation ought to be urging our elected officials at the federal level to put partisan politics aside for just a little bit and solve this one particular problem. And to continue on to that same point, Antonio, if you can kind of paint us a picture of who, who exactly are these dreamers or these you know, DACA recipients? What, what are they currently doing? I mean, do they, uh, I'm sure you know that they have to pass certain requirements in order to even be considered, but. Can't have criminal records. Sure. Um, have to pay taxes. Um, I work very closely with a dreamer community. And by the way, everyone dreams of being in this great country. Right. Um, uh, this particular group, I think you were talking about in the green room, the word dreamer comes from an actual um, bill that right. was being proposed by Orrin Hatch, who Jabin works for, um, the Republican senior member of the Senate. Um, and that's why that, that name comes from that. Um, hardworking, visionary young people that don't know anything but what they've had in this country. I mean, at one point when I came here from Nicaragua, I was working and going to school, um, but I didn't have my papers. My mother married an American, and all of a sudden I did. But I had grown up here in my whole, my whole life. I remember when I'd go back to Nicaragua, I didn't feel like I completely fit in. Um, I absolutely did not. My Spanish is horrible, um, and that's by Nicaraguan standards, Jay. Um, and, and, and at the same time, here in the United States, I didn't quite completely fit in. So you really are kind of up, up in the air. Um, there is a reason why people are fighting so hard and 80% of the country last told it supports some sort of a, of a dream act. Um, and that, by the way, is different than, than DACA. Um, I think Danny's right. It was a Band-Aid and it was torn off. And the president has, it, has that right to tear that Band-Aid off. Um, what I don't like is the, the mixed messages. One second is, I can't do anything about these families being torn apart, that there's something only Congress can do, and then all of a sudden an executive order goes by, and then when Congress said, okay, we're gonna try to act, and I, again, I just met with these senators, they were in markup, and they were ready to put something forth, and then it's, nope, I don't wanna do this until after the election. Um, it is completely a political football. Um, but the dreamers that I know, we have a program that we're starting um, in a few weeks called the Dream Lead Institute. And it is that value proposition that dreamers have for this country. The patriotism that's within anyone that lives in this country, um, that, that has an opportunity, the blessing, to wake up every single day on this land. I am blessed that I'm actually a citizen. If you're not, that's what you aspire to be um, in terms of being permanently here. Um, these are entrepreneurs, which we need. These are working in the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and math. These are innovators, where we rank something like 23rd in innovation in the country. We better use every resource that we have in this great country, in cada rincón de este país, to be able to access that talent. Um, a lot of this, if you think about the H-1B visas, the last I checked, they have 60,000, and they're all used up within a week for the entire year. Um, you better tap every resource that you have in this country. And those dreamers are a tremendous resource that you can use to move not just the dreamer community forward, but America forward. Um, so everything I have seen in terms of thoughtful Americans in every way you could imagine, unfortunately, they have this additional challenge. Um, and I think it's really important that we move them um, into a space where they actually can demonstrate that value to America. Right, and, and, and the solution, you mentioned that it was a Band-Aid fix. I think it was, it, was, it was Danny that mentioned that being a Band-Aid fix back in 2012. Now, in, in the title itself, DACA, it's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival. So deferred action meaning that they were just going to prolong, essentially, or defer their, the, the deportation of, of these folks who are here um, without proper documentation. So in and of itself, even when it was created, it was not going to provide the necessary certainty that a piece of legislation would have provided from Congress, right? And so we have these, these, these DACA recipients that have, you know, paid their $500 fees to, to apply, that have passed the background checks, have passed the necessary requirements of either being in school or working, have passed 
uh, the, their, their lawful requirements to where they can't have any felonies, they can't have more than uh, three minor misdemeanors or a significant misdemeanor. They have passed all these different things and continue to do so every two years that they've had to renew, but we've gotten to the point where they're not able to fully plan their lives or reach their maximum potential if, you're, uh, if your ability to plan is contingent on renewing every two years or even if this program is gonna be eliminated uh, in the next six months, for example. And so a lot of the work that the Leave It Initiative is doing is, is, is much of with, with, with the DREAMers and immigration as a whole, but the DREAMers in particular, we think that in order for them to be able to fully contribute to society, which they already are doing, and it's, and it's been proven, that they need to be able to have the certainty to best plan their lives, to know if they can buy a car in six months, for their employers to know what's gonna happen in a year, right? All these different things that affect their communities, affect their economic impacts, their contributions, and just their overall well-being, right? And so that's, that's the lens that we've taken uh, for trying to find a solution to this, this uh, immigration situation. Um, and I will say, I mean, you, you already touched on a lot, but I mean, there's, there's school teachers, they're serving in the military, I mean, they're, they're, they're going to church with us. I mean, you may not know that someone is, is a DACA recipient, right, unless you were to ask them, because these these folks came here at an average age of six years old. So when, when Antonio said that they, they know no other country, it's because the average age that they came here brought by their parents was six years old. You know, many, many younger than that. Um, some of which don't even speak their, the language of their home country, for example. I've met people that, you know, that, that uh, for example, a friend of mine in, in Texas, he, he came at the age of one from Mexico. And he speaks, he speaks Spanish, but you know, he, he admits that he's more comfortable speaking English because that's, he grew up in Texas, he grew up in the States. Let, let me just interrupt real quick because I think there's, there's something important that we need to recognize as well. Um, we have those of us here speaking to you, we're all of Hispanic descent, but this is not a Hispanic issue. Uh, there are folks that are in this situation, whether they be DACA recipients or undocumented immigrants from, every corner of the planet. You know, and I know I grew up in New York. In the New York area, there are thousands of undocumented Irish people, for example. So this is not a Tijerino Vargas Hernandez problem. This is an American problem. And we, the first step in beginning to address the issue, whether it's the undocumented uh, immigrant issue or immigration as a whole as it relates to our economy and our security, the first step in beginning to resolve that is agreeing all of us that we're all to blame for where we are right now, right? The folks that either came here legally and overstayed their visas, which is 60% of the undocumented population, those that entered the country on, in, a, in an illegal way, uh, the employers that are hiring them, the Congress that has failed to reform the system, administrations of both parties that have failed to enforce the laws. So I, I talk about the fact that the, on the border for many years we had two signs. One side said, keep out. The other side said, we're hiring, right? So that, there's, a, there's a dichotomy of messages that, that are being sent to people, right? I use the analogy of a, of a broken traffic light. On one side, you have a big office building with lots of companies, lots of jobs that need to get done. On the other side, you've got the workers that need to get to work. Every time a worker crosses that intersection, they're breaking the law, right? So we can either stand on the side and yell at the people, or we can fix the traffic light. Fix the traffic light so we have a traffic light that actually works, that allows those companies that need to hire workers to do so in a way that brings people in in a, in a legal way. Because I will tell you, every company that I've talked to, I'm involved, I used to chair the workforce board for the Commonwealth. I've been involved in cha chambers of commerce. Every company that I speak to, small, medium, and large, their biggest headache so what keeps them up at night is talent, people, finding the workforce that they need to fill those jobs. Right now, I guarantee that the immigration system that we have does not meet the needs of those employers, and we need to figure out a way to be able to, to do that. Because if I, like many of you, want our economy to grow, I want to create more jobs in this economy, I want to create more prosperities, prosperity for American citizens, but that growth will stop dead in its track if we don't have the ability to put people into open jobs. And, and part of the, that great need is in terms of certain jobs that you're trying to meet, 
in the te in technology space and in other areas. We have a program called Code as a Second Language specifically to teach kids how to code. All over the country are doing it in markets all over the country. One of them was Omaha, Nebraska. There is a small Mexican population that is all concentrated. And it's out of exactly what Danny was just talking about. It is out of trying to fill jobs ultimately and actually building those pipelines. So now the University of Nebraska Omaha will have more computer science majors, which then means that the Fortune 500 companies, I think it's the largest per capita place for Fortune 500 is in Omaha, Nebraska. And that's not exactly a place that's a destination for people that want to get a job. We work with a lot of companies in terms of Facebook and Disney and all these other companies identifying talent. It is in the tech space. And it's not, and it should never be, I, I hate to say this, but it really should be a business proposition. It shouldn't be because, oh, we need to help Latinos. And No, it's because the numbers don't add up if you don't uh, target this community. Um, and, and just as a last thing, uh, I, I, I stand in solidarity with our uh, dreamers from Ireland, but I bet they didn't get yelled at at a restaurant to be thrown out of the country and have ICE called them because they had Irish accents in New York um, or detained in, in Montana because they were speaking in, with Irish accents, buying eggs at a grocery store. Yeah, there is an ugly component to this. And the other thing that, I, that we'd be remiss uh, if we didn't bring up is the fact that in addition to a lot of people that, are, that came here uh, looking for better opportunities for work and so forth, there's also the fact that there are a lot of people that are trying to escape incredibly awful situations like the ones that uh, Tony described earlier. One of the things that we also need to take into account is as long as they, we have those awful situations in some of these worst countries, in Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, we're going to continue to have these types of, of issues. So part of it has to be a diplomatic push, a foreign aid push to be able to create better environments in those situations, in those source countries. That's, that's a part that often doesn't get any attention paid to it. So we need to be, make sure that we're including uh, the sort of the, the international uh, foreign aid diplomacy component in the conversation. You know, on the, on the economic front and, and to kind of pivot a little bit away about on, on immigration and just because I think it's also timely to, to briefly touch on tax reform. I mean, the economy is doing really well right now, right? We've seen continued growth. We've seen the, the labor force or the labor market is, is tight right now, which is, which is good. It's a sign of a healthy economy. We're seeing unemployment rates at, a, at an all-time low, especially for, for Latinos, mm -hmm. right? And so we've also seen a lot of jobs being unfilled. And, and there's, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal about two months ago that there was an article, if you took every single unemployed person in the Midwest and you forced them somehow into an open job in the Midwest, there'd still be 180,000 unfilled jobs. Right. And so there are jobs being un unfilled right now. in the right tech now. industry, it's going to be 2 million unfilled right. jobs oh. within the next year. Um, and then it gets worse from there. And who knows what's going to happen when artificial intelligence pops in. Right. And then you've got to deal with a whole other set of issues. And so you have to get out in front of these things because we're smiling about unemployment now. But uh, in order to grow the economy, um, you need more people to fill more jobs. Right, and we have, we have an aging workforce right now. We have a low fertility rate. You know, less people are having less kids. Just 10,000 baby boomers reach retirement age every single day. Yeah. Um, so where are you going to get that or, movement? Or even the Social Security. Social Security is going to run out sooner than expected. Medicare funding is going to run out sooner than expected. It's all these different things that have an economic impact, which is why it's so important to make sure that we're not restricting this flow of immigration and this, uh, I think, a blessing in the, in the fact that we have, uh, it, and similar to how we do free trade with countries for goods and services, I think the flow of human capital is so important for a country to continue to uh, grow economically, right? And that's something that, you know, as, 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 as a strong nation, we're, we're very fortunate to have that. So, you know, right now, the, I believe it's the average immigrant is 28 years old, and so that's the sort of balance. The average Latino is 28. The average Latino it's like is 10 28. Years younger than the rest of the population. Right, and so it's, it's these sort of things that, for demographic shifts as well, when talking about the labor force and when talking about jobs being unfilled, it's also something important to consider. 33% of the entire Latino community is under 18 years old. Wow. Mm -hmm. And one-fourth of our entire school system right now is Latino. I think it's 24%. Yep. You know, but then how do you keep up? 
because teachers is under 7% that are Latino. And, and, it's, and it's, yes, we talk about the tech sector. That's really incredibly important. Um, but it's also every level of the economy, right? It's from high-tech workers and engineers and so forth, but you also need people to support those folks that might have certifications. You also need people in the service sector, in the hospitality and, and, and food as a veteran, and beverage. As a veteran. And, in, absolutely, in, and we in, need in folks the in the military. military. So we need, we need bodies. We haven't figured out how to clone 20-something-year-olds yet. If we ever do, then maybe we'll How's have a different issue. Do? How's the sheep doing? Right, yeah. <laughs> so unless we figure out how to clone 20-something-year-olds immediately, we're going to need to figure out a, a, an immigration system that actually works to meet the needs of our economy. We our may state. not be too far off from cloning because we did just create a space force for those that were uh, keeping an eye on that. Though I do think it's important to say that the Air Force has already been doing a lot of space work, so it's not completely out of nowhere uh, to, to create that. Um, an Air Force, an Air Force. And so, yeah. Um, you know, that, that's an interesting thing to, to kind of see where that goes because, I mean, the Air Force was derived from the Army. So it's, it's you know, these... Uh, uh, adapting to to the environment and, and seeing how to best uh, defend our country, but uh, I digress there. Um, that was funny though. Uh, um, Improvise and overcome. Seriously, <laughs> tough crowd though. Uh, got a few chuckles. <laughs> got him from the panels. <laughs> um, okay, so just to kind of wrap things up uh, here, where we are today, um, no solution on DACA. Uh, no solution to what's going on at the border. Uh, Congress seems to just kind of want to wait until the courts decide what's going on well, with the, the future of DACA. Well, the president said we're done with immigration until after the elections. Right, right. So it's uh, not just Congress. So political football, this, yep. the issue is being politicized as it has been. Uh, I, I think it's safe to say for the past 30 years. Um, and, and we say for the past 30 years because there hasn't been any significant legislation to change the immigration system since the 1980s. Um, so just something to keep in mind as we're renegotiating trade deals that are 20 years old and rightfully so, uh, we haven't modernized our immigration system to meet these market forces and, 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 and meet the needs of a 21st century economy, quite frankly. Um, so where do we go from here? What, what, what should we be looking forward to? What can we do, I think, to uh, try to address the situation or at least move the ball forward in that direction? So we talked a little bit about that. I think it, I think it begins in this room. I think every single person in this room gets in touch with their member of Congress and say, do your job, right? Work together to address this. The, the, the framework of what needs to happen is fairly well known. It's fairly well established, right? Uh, we need to, there's some disagreement about the, the details of it, but we can uh, move in the direction of having an immigration system that makes it easier to be able to bring in the type of workforce that we need. Uh, we know we're going to have to address uh, the border situation. I'd say that it's not just the southern border, it's the northern border, because that's where a lot of the 9-11 hijackers came from, was from Canada. It's also the ports of entry, the airports and the seaports, so we need to have a, a comprehensive security uh, strategy. Uh, I talk about, as a military guy, I talk about operational control is what we uh, should be striving for, because absolute uh, sealed, secure, everything is not only incredibly difficult to achieve, but it would take more money than we can afford to spend as a, as a country. Uh, so that, those are two. Uh, and then third, we need to have an interior enforcement uh, program where our employers are hiring people that are now legal to, to work here. And then that brings us then to what do you do with the 11 million or so that are undocumented that got caught up in the system of, an, of a broken immigration process for the last 30 years. Okay, so we have to, to come to grips with that. Yes, those people need to, because uh, we're not going to hire a bunch of buses and airplanes and ship people, 11 million people out. So they need to go through a process by which we confirm that they have not committed crimes, that they are willing to pay back taxes, that they are willing to... Uh, learn English and, and all the things that we've talked about, right? But Congress needs to decide how to move forward with that. It, we tried to do it as a big comprehensive approach back in 2006, uh, and it failed for a variety of reasons. I think mostly because both parties were using it as a political wedge issue for elections and campaigns. So the other approach is, well, do it in pieces. Okay, we can do that, but let's make sure that piece one leads to piece two, leads to piece three, and not just do piece one and forget about pieces two and three, right? So how do you ensure those guarantees are, are put in there? Congress, I think it's up to us to be able to tell them we are at a point now uh, as a nation where we understand 
that the system needs to be fixed, that we need to deal with the crisis that we're facing both inside the country as well as uh, other parts of the world and tell them either do your job or we'll replace you. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, we're gonna replace you because you haven't done your jobs. I just want to make sure that we don't lose sight of what's at the foot of the Statue of Liberty that welcomed so many immigrants at the turn of the last century that has made America what it is today in terms of bringing your tired, your hungry. Um, also that there's a, a lamp by the golden door. Um, the rhetoric that we're hearing conflating all immigration and why we need to secure our borders, which is legitimate, except then all of a sudden it pivots to because MS-13 is going to come in here. No. Antonio Tijerino is going to come in here. Jay Ben Castro is going to come in here. Kevin Hernandez, Danny, and others are coming in here too. Um, and that is the part that I think we need to get back to, is making sure that we're looking at this in categories in terms of what immigrants bring to this country, that value proposition immigrants bring to this country. And it is not as simple as just going in and grabbing a ticket um, at a restaurant you know, to wait when your meal is going to be called up. It is a complicated process that Kevin knows more about than, than either of us, but I believe you have to go back to your home country for 10 years and then come back in and apply. And who knows how long that waiting list is. Um, it is not as simple as they're making it sound in terms of just walking in and saying, I'm, I want to be a citizen of the United States. It's a privilege to be a citizen of the United States. Some are born into that privilege. Some have to go through a lot to get to that place. Um, so thank you for having yep. us. I really appreciate leaving it, and I appreciate everyone here that came out here and gave up their, their Saturdays. And I, I actually look forward to the question and answer part mm -hmm. the most, because we all should be challenged. Um, and it's important that we have organizations like Livre that are bringing us all together. And I know Dan couldn't be here because I think he's with a delegation with Senator Cruz uh, down at the border right now. He just texted me and said, thanks for doing this. Um, but it's important when we did our Hispanic Heritage Awards and we're in front of um, a te television audience and we're in front of PBS, that we did a tribute to Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. And I had Dan present that segment representing Livre because Livre stands for the dialogue that we need to have as, as a country to see what's best for this country. I'll, I'll add just one thing that we haven't touched on. You know, we talked about some of the conflation that's taking place with MS-13 and so forth. I think every single one of us agrees if they are particularly undocumented immigrants or anyone in, for that anyone. matter that commits violent crimes, uh, that's dealing drugs or what have you, absolutely pick them up, put them in jail, throw away the key if they're um, undocumented then deport them, but that's a different conversation, right? That's a different conversation than what we're talking about here. Um, so let's not confuse the two. Yeah, and uh, just to sort of summarize uh, our position as an organization, I mean, we're gonna continue until we have a permanent legislative solution. We're gonna continue pushing for certainty for DREAMers through a permanent legislative solution, which we feel DACA didn't provide the necessary permanency that they need and in order to do so, we need Congress to actually act on that um, and enhance security along the border. I mean, I think uh, folks have different definitions of that, but at the end of the day, we are a nation of, of, of laws uh, and, and the rule of law should be respected, but also we should know who's coming into our country and who's not. Um, and so in order to, uh, we believe, further sort of secure the border, we need to remove the incentives for people to come here the, the, the wrong way, so to say, right? We need to make sure that the front door is open for people to come in the legal channels, but in order to do so, those channels need to be modernized. We need to fix our immigration system so people can actually have the ability to come here the right way, and we're not turning away people who are seeking opportunity and who you would be, uh, it would be a mutual beneficial uh, sort of development of their talents and, and, and uh, their contributions to, our, to communities here in the country. And so with that, I will turn it back over to Michael for, um, few questions and answers. Gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for the conversation. I appreciate everyone's leadership uh, on these policy issues, very important for the country. Uh, so I want to transition right now to uh, Q&A, question and answers. Uh, we got a lot of very good questions from our audience, so thank you very much. Uh, I think we have time for maybe three or four questions. Let's do it. Uh, next five minutes, and then I can make some closing remarks. Yeah, because Mexico plays that a lot. Oh, I was hoping uh, you didn't uh, remind uh, people of that. <laughs> Sorry. 
Oh, it's, is it's, it? It's one zero. Mexico's winning? Okay, there. <laughs> There I'm Colombian, so I'm waiting for the game tomorrow, <laughs> but in spirit, I'm pulling for Mexico. Same here, Kevin. Yeah. Okay, first question is from uh, Jabin Castro. Uh, the question is, how do we stop immigration issues to go from emergencies into solution? Uh, how do we get to immigration reform? Touched on that, but that, that should be a question, Kevin. I yeah, hear what he says more just than because we kind of okay. talked about this with how the Obama administration sort of dealt with things and how the Trump administration is dealing with things now. I don't think you can really expect a crisis like that to occur, right? And so naturally, it's going to be a bit reactive to, to the situation. Um, you know, there are things that could have been done a lot better in 2014 under the Obama administration when we saw that spike of unaccompanied children. Uh, I think that there are lessons to be learned from that that this administration, I think, has taken notice of and, and can maybe uh, sort of uh, implement some of, the, some of the lessons and challenges learned from that 2014 uh, situation. But um, I think Antonio touched, touched on this earlier. I mean, it's, it's, it's really figuring out the root cause of why people are fleeing and willing to come here, uh, I guess, the, the unlawful way, right, and willing to sacrifice everything to travel here. And it's because there's a lot of turmoil in the region. And I think we have to acknowledge that, right? Whether, whether you think that it's acceptable for us to take everyone in or not, you know, all these folks who are seeking asylum have their right to due process, which is something that we pride ourselves on as a nation. And so whether, whether they get that asylum approved or not, the fact that they have the due process is one, one thing that's uh, necessary. Um, but not all these folks are actually having their asylums approved is, is another thing to take into consideration. I mean, some, some folks are determined that their, that their uh, fear maybe is not necessarily credible enough to be granted asylum. And so all these folks that are coming to the border or seeking asylum at ports of entry do not necessarily uh, stay in the states. So I think that's one thing to put into context. Also, another thing, you know, we're often hearing about border apprehensions and about, you know, uh, just the need for more... Uh, resources at the border. I think that more resources are needed uh, to make sure that we're equipping our uh, CBP men and women who are risking their lives, you know, as, as other law enforcement officials are at the border, not knowing who exactly is coming there. Um, but to the point that I mentioned earlier, I think we have to make sure that we're, that we're creating a system that's more streamlined, that's able to uh, adapt to the situations of the 21st century and allows people who are willing to come here and contribute without doing our country harm, I think we can come up with a way to do that. It's just been 30 plus years since we've modernized well, I'll, I'd also add that in, in addition to our immigration system being broken, Congress is broken also. Um, too many politicians, Republicans and Democrats, are just looking for ways to be able to beat up the other side during the elections in November so that they can stay in power for another two years. It shouldn't be about just points on the board and power in Congress. It should be about solving problems and, and working with people and helping the economy. That's what it ought to be about. We can fight about individual issues and, uh, uh, and partisan ways. Look, I'm a Republican, and I'm more than happy to sit down with with a Democrat to deal with some of the bigger, more vexing issues, and then later on we can fight about other things. Something this important, this big, that has such an impact on our culture and our society and our economy and our security, this is the type of thing that we ought to be able to figure out a way to sit down together and come up with solutions to this problem. Maybe it's going to take a special uh, commission or a task force or uh, saying this is uh, going to be the group that's come up, going to come up with the best solution and let Congress vote on it so that they are removed from uh, the penalty of coming up with a decision. But I think Congress and the, and the White House need to say, forget about partisanship for this particular issue. We can find about other things. Let's fix this. Well, they did have a bipartisan bill that was put forward that was slapped away. So, so much for that. Go ahead. Uh, next question is, uh, if you bring skilled people to work these jobs uh, in offices, aren't they skilled enough and uh, wealthy enough to stay in their country? Uh, education is a privilege there. People are paying to be able to go to work, to be able to go to school, to be able to go to church, because they're being extorted, and they actually have to pay protection to be able to walk down a street. No matter how smart you are, no matter how educated you are, 
you don't have the benefit of simply having a life where you can get up in the morning and go to work. It is much more complicated than all of this. But I, I think just even the fact that they're, you said high skilled, sure, there, I think there are countries that are not necessarily in turmoil where there are educated people that still want to immigrate. I mean, my parents immigrated from Colombia in the 80s. There's a lot of turmoil going on in Colombia in the 80s, right, to say the least. Uh, right now, you know, thank God the situation is a lot better. Uh, it's got a strong economy. It's got a lot of foreign direct investment. It's, it, is, it is a strong democracy in South America. There are a lot of educated folks in Colombia. And so we should want those that are wanting to immigrate here with those high skills. I mean, sure, if they want to stay in Colombia, that's fine. But we should, we should be welcoming that. We, shouldn't, we, shouldn't, we benefit from the high skill or even the low skill. We, just, we benefit from the human capital. But as, as, as a nation and as an economy, you know, especially those that are coming here with already skills, be it language skills, be it uh, tech skills, be it you know, college degrees or whatnot, I think it is a mutually beneficial exchange of when someone comes here and puts that talent to use for the betterment of our society a lot of in them America. Have no interest in coming here right now. Uh, yeah, and not everyone exactly. Not well, everyone. I, could, I mean, and look, there was an immigrant way back in I think the '40s named Albert Einstein that <laughs> did okay coming over here to the United States, and but that's or a guy named Steve Jobs, right. you know, that was an actual refugee at one point from Syria. Yeah. So there, there, we benefit from great minds, but um, I, I do think that, for instance, when we're out there prospecting in certain parts of the world uh, to get people coming over here for H-1B visas to fill certain jobs, my wife is Filipina, you are fast-tracked if you are a nurse from the Philippines to come to the United States. Um, there is value in having someone that can come over here and fill a job, especially with the, how great the economy is doing and how low the... Uh, you know, the unemployment rate is. But here's the, here's the flip side of the coin before we move on, though. You don't know who the next chief Steve Jobs is, right? That, that, that could be someone who's coming yeah, here already with an engineering degree. It could be a dreamer degree, that's already here. Or it could be, exactly, it could be someone who's already here. It could be someone who maybe the government considers them, quote, unquote, low-skilled. And so that's why, that's why it's important to not necessarily have a system where the government's trying to engineer this sort of end result, right? We've gotten to the point where we are because of the spontaneous order of immigrants coming here. Uh, not necessarily because we've required X amount of engineers to come over here, or X amount of lawyers. Uh, we've, we've gotten to this point all throughout the 18, 1900s. I mean, we've gotten to where we are today because we don't know who the next Steve Jobs is. It could be the person who's coming over. It could be their child. I mean, 40%, just, just if, if you can leave with one thing, 40% of all Fortune 500s are started by either an immigrant or the child of an immigrant. And so you never know who that child of the immigrant is going to be. Well said. Well said. So. <clears throat> Next question is, uh, what can our local leaders here in Virginia uh, do to help with this immigration situation? Okay, so uh, the first thing we need to do is understand that this is a federal issue, right? Uh, so our local and state level officials need to implore their, our federal officials members of Congress, uh, senators, to be part of the solution. Uh, we've got a delegation where we've got two U.S. senators, 11 members of Congress, so that's 13 people that we need to uh, tell them, all of us, tell them that they need to get around the table and begin working on a fix to this problem. Uh, we've got both Democrats and Republicans that represent us in, in the Congress. We, all of us, take our, our labels off and tell them to get to work. I think that's one of the first steps we can do. I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't make a shameless plug here, but I think you can go on belivre.org if you want to find out how to write to your members automatically. You can reach out to Lorenzo or Michael, who are doing this work each and every day. I mean, we're having, we're having phone call, we're having members call their, or sorry, volunteers call their members. We're having folks door knock. We're having events throughout Virginia and throughout D.C. that we're planning over time. And we're making sure that enough people are speaking out and that those members you know, our, 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 that sort of information or that action is being flagged. Because if enough of us take that action and enough of us make those calls, then it's, it's more than enough reason for them to actually act and not just kick this down the road. Let me ask you a quick question. Show of hands, how many of you think that um, this current situation that we have related to immigration and 
and so forth. How many think it's, it's okay? You know, how many of you think that needs to be fixed? Something needs to be done about it? Okay, because the, the chaos that we see right now, the, the situation that we see with uh, the undocumented population, with businesses that are able to fill jobs, that will continue and get worse. Every day that we don't do something, the chaos that we see, the uh, unsustainable situation will only get worse. So the time is now to tell our federal officials to fix it. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for your remarks today. I, I, on a personal level, a professional level, appreciate everything you guys are doing uh, every day uh, within your realms, right, uh, to advance this issue. I mean, it's going to take a lot of people from different backgrounds and perspectives to come together uh, at the end of the day to eventually find a solution to this. And this is a good transition now for uh, my closing remarks. So, uh, you know, as the uh, coalition's director for uh, the Libre Initiative Virginia, uh, we're working hard every day to engage uh, Hispanic leaders across Virginia on uh, immigration policy and other policies that uh, create a more vibrant, independent, and, and prosperous Hispanic community. Uh, again, I want to recognize uh, my colleague, uh, Lorenzo Martinez. Raise your hand. Lorenzo is our field director uh, here, in, here in Virginia. He's been on board longer than I have uh, with the organization, but he's been doing fantastic work in the Richmond area, so I want to recognize uh, your hard work, your contributions. Thank you for bringing uh, a good team of people up here to, to learn more about this policy issue. Uh, I also want to plug our Facebook page. Everyone has a smartphone, I imagine, on them. Do, does everyone, raise your hand if you use Facebook. Yeah, no, no almost everyone. Well, statistically uh, speaking, Latinos <laughs> use cell phone internet more so than, than other groups, yeah. actually, too. And I know, Antonio, you work a lot on that, so no excuses. <laughs> uh, I want to plug, uh, go on Facebook and like our Facebook page, uh, the Libre Initiative Virginia. Our Facebook page is, uh, has a lot of content. Uh, we're promoting, pro promoting a lot of events, a lot of activities, our pictures. We're going to have a, a Facebook Live on the page today. We're going to have uh, more videos and more attention on this issue and other areas that we're working on. Uh, and so, uh, again, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for coming here today. It means a lot to me. I know there's a, a very important uh, World Cup game, so it means even more to me that you're all here today. Uh, and uh, thank you so much. Gracias por estar aquí. If you have any questions, come meet me. I'm available, and uh, I look forward to meeting a lot of you uh, beyond this. Lorenzo, do you have something? Uh, yeah, thank you, Lorenzo. I almost forgot. Thank you for catching me again. I, as Lorenzo was saying, I'll say with the mic, I want to recognize former Delegate Anderson and uh, Prince William County Supervisor Ruth, Ruth Anderson of the Occoquan District. Thank you guys uh, for being here. We really appreciate your leadership on the, on the community level. Thank you very much. Well, with that, I want to wrap it up. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Be on the lookout for future events and uh, new ways to get involved with us. So thank you very much for being here.